My name is Nicholas Carey. Um, I was born to a French mother, so uh, I can relate to everyone's experience here. My father lives in South America. My sister has been in Africa the past two years, and I have traveled about 350,000 miles in the past 12 months, uh, lecturing, speaking about Bitcoin, uh, meeting with legal and governmental affair bodies, and uh, basically doing advocacy work um, as much as possible. And on the side, I run Blockchain, which is the world's most widely used Bitcoin company. Um, we have three category leading services. So we build wallets to let people secure, send and receive, and transact Bitcoin. We have about 3.5 million users. We have a search engine that lets people go study transactions that are happening on the Bitcoin network. And at the core of our business is a developer platform that lets software engineers, wherever they are, build really cool applications for the Bitcoin blockchain. So I'm going to take you through today. There are probably some experts in Bitcoin up here, but also in the audience. But before you can really kind of understand why this is such an interesting innovation, it's super important to understand the fundamentals about it. So let's just take a quick moment to build some context. Imagine a world with completely frictionless payments. A world where you can send value from a fly fishing lodge in Patagonia instantly all the way across the world to Singapore, basically for free. Imagine a world where you had a global payments network, a payments platform with zero barriers to entry, where anyone, regardless of where they were born or what color their skin is or what their gender is, could choose to participate. It's voluntary. So that's what Bitcoin is just at a very, very high level. It's a global payments network, and it kind of possesses three things. It has a currency, it has the ability to settle transactions with a high degree of certainty, and you can do this anywhere in the world. It's a network for the age of the internet. So I'm gonna discuss a couple things which are the basics of Bitcoin. I want to go through the history, which is kind of interesting, and it's still sort of evolving. Finally, the economics of Bitcoin, which are very interesting and very debatable. <laughs> and then some charts and trends. Uh, we can talk about where we've come from in just a few short years. So, at the most basic level, Bitcoin is a technology. It's also a computer protocol. We use protocols in the devices that we have in our pockets every single day. Most people in here send emails to their friends and loved ones, and that relies on something called TCP IP, which, relies, which lets your phone send messages to a network of servers all over the world and instantly deliver, deliver email wherever you are to anyone you want to. So just like there's a global messaging service, essentially, Bitcoin is a financial protocol for the internet. And uh, we've been in desperate need of this. It's also a huge network. It's the world's largest distributed computing project on Earth. And so uh, basically, if you were to take the world's 500 most powerful supercomputers, it would not be more powerful than Bitcoin. So what does it kind of look like? This is an abstraction. Essentially, people can choose to download a piece of software and run it on their computer. Now, you kind of need specialized equipment to do this now, but you can still experiment with it, and that makes you a node on the network. And for participating in the network, if you uh, basically lend your computing power to update the transactions that are happening, you're rewarded every 10 minutes or so with tiny fees and small amounts of Bitcoin. So it's participatory. So, you have the three basics of a transaction network. A currency, a trusted ledger to settle the transaction chain of who owns what, and fundamentally, settlement with a high degree of certainty. And these are requirements in order to have a global payment network. So, <clears throat> oftentimes Bitcoin is confused with many things. I would say nine out of 10 people a year ago had never heard about Bitcoin. And now nine out of 10 people have probably heard the wrong things, but that's okay because it means we're making some progress, I think. Um, but Bitcoin is not a company, it is not illegal, um, it's not centrally controlled, it's not proprietary, it's entirely open source, and uh, it's not bound by jurisdictions the way we think of other types of applications. Um, it's entirely a global phenomenon. So the photography you'll see in this presentation, by the way, was taken over the past year um, as I traveled around the world. So fundamentally, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer payment network. We use peer-to-peer -peer technology a lot, we just don't always know it. Skype, for example, was based on peer-to-peer -peer telephony, and voice over IP completely changed the way we talk on phones, and we don't even realize it. Bitcoin will do the same thing for money. So when a transaction is made, it is instantly broadcasted to something called the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, I'll have a demonstration of this in a minute, but basically transactions are sent between wallets, between people to exchanges, and soon between machines. So what does it look like? Well, you have a Bitcoin wallet, which you can download and install on your phone, 
in 30 seconds, you basically put an application that is free, that's open source, onto your smartphone that completely replaces all of your banking needs. And uh, you can then give someone a Bitcoin address, just like if I wanted to send Eric an email, he would need to give me an email address. If I wanted to send Eric some Bitcoin, he would show me a Bitcoin address. It's like a public routing number to his wallet. So when that transaction is made, it broadcasts a transaction to a giant network all over the world, and you can visit the uh, blockchain.info, and you can see the transactions streaming in real time. To give you a sense for the scope of this, we're doing about $300 million worth of transactions a week. And uh, two or three years ago, when that study came out, there were maybe 2,000 or 3,000 transactions a day on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now there are over 100,000 every single day. So you have to look at the overall speed at which things are happening and the trajectory. But it shouldn't be a big surprise. Sending Bitcoin from one place to another is the most efficient way in the world to send value right now. If I wanted to uh, send these chairs to New York City, it would be faster to FedEx them than to wire money there right now. But using Bitcoin, I can do it instantly. So let's talk a little bit about the history. It's only a five or six year old experiment. It was introduced conceptually as a white paper by a group of developers or a developer, we're not really sure, um, that launched as a network in 2009. In 2010, some basic marketplaces formed and people were discussing Bitcoin, but the people that were doing this were cryptographers and computer scientists, really, really nerdy people. Um, in 2011, there was some angel investment in the space. And uh, at that point, more and more people started to pay a bit of attention to it. In 2012, merchants all over the world started to accept Bitcoin. And this is sort of curious. Usually consumer adoption sort of beats out merchant adoption. In Bitcoin, it's happening at about the same rate. And there's a really good reason. When you go buy a cup of coffee or you pay for something at a small store, Every time you make a transaction with your card, there's a base fee, and then the merchant eats a two to three percent cost on every transaction, just to accept a form of payment and just to give you goods that you want. And actually, these have costs for consumers. If you don't think that we're at some point eating those costs, you're absolutely wrong. Um, so merchants started accepting Bitcoin because when they take a Bitcoin payment, they get 100 percent of the transaction. It's just like handing somebody euros or dollars or yen, except it happens digitally. Now, what you do with those is up to you. You can go sell them, or you can keep them and spend them again, creating hopefully a virtuous economy. So in 2013, there was a huge surge in startups in the industry. Last year, $650 million of venture capital poured into Bitcoin companies. That is an absurd amount of money. Um, it is more money that went into the early internet to go into these projects. And they're going into Bitcoin and blockchain type projects because there's an incredible opportunity in this industry. I'll talk a little bit about that. The economics are really kind of interesting. We spend our entire lives in pursuit of money, or some of the students here will probably start to do that soon, paying off student debts like I had to. And we don't always think a whole lot about where money comes from and what creates value. They print paper bills and they put people's pictures on them and we're believed that this is supposed to be tender, that we can be able to redeem for goods and services. And every single year, we hope that that'll be the case next year. What happens, though, is that more and more money gets printed every single year through things like quantitative easing, central banks just print incredible amounts of money. Well, Bitcoin has a very, very different approach. It's a fixed inflation schedule. We know exactly how much money is going to come into circulation, so it's predictable. This is very different. So basically, coins are going to be released on that uh, curve. Every four years, there are fewer of them. Some people ask, why did so many come into circulation at the beginning? Well, the idea was to incentivize the transaction velocity. More people have them, then they'll share them. Um, the network is maintained, again, by volunteers who lend their computing power and energy to secure the transactions. Basically, what that means is they keep track of a database, and for doing that, they're rewarded with small fees. Um, so the whole thing is regulated by mathematics. There are no politicians involved. All the rules were written when the network was launched, and that's the way it is. There is a software update process, so you can make updates to the Bitcoin protocol, and that requires consensus from all the members of the network. It's pretty cool. So let's think for a minute. We as human beings have invented all kinds of things in our lives. We invented wheels so that we could drive around. We invented shovels so we could dig holes, and then tractors so that we could build roads, right? We do things to create more efficiencies. Why can't we create a better form of money well, let's think about it. For the age of the internet, what kind of properties would you want a money to have? You might want your money to be easily uh, able to divide and recombine. It, you would want your money to be impossible to counterfeit. You want your money to be durable. 
Paper money is sort of ridiculous. If you wash it, it gets destroyed, it can burn in a fire. Um, how about money that you could instantly redeem on any smartphone with a secret passphrase? So even if you chuck your phone into the Seine or, uh, or have an accident with it or drop it, you don't lose your money. All those things are possible. In the age of the internet, you'd really want to be able to send that money anywhere in the world instantly, basically for free, allowing you to create relationships which essentially almost all human interactions at some point fundamentally come down to transacting. If you can bring everyone into the sphere of economic influence of the internet, then you're onto something very powerful. Well, Bitcoin does that too. And for the first time, Bitcoin is the only transaction network with something that has zero counterparty risk. So right now, if I have a deal with Eric and he provides some consulting services to me and I ask for a payment, let's say I take a credit card payment, well, I, he could issue a chargeback. So he could do the work and then get his money back. That's kind of a problem. And because of all these types of intermediaries, whether it's credit card companies, merchant processors, banks, there's tons of friction in every transaction that happens. And that doesn't need to be the case. Peer-to-peer -peer transactions are much more frictionless and therefore have lower costs and are basically better for everyone on both sides. So I submit that if you were to design a currency, Bitcoin would be an interesting experiment for the age of the internet. Is it perfect? Probably not. But there are going to be many, many other experiments in this industry as well. So um, where are we today? Um, this is some high-level information. The overall network is worth about $3.35 billion. So this is actually not that big. Um, a skyscraper in London is more valuable than the entire Bitcoin network right now. So just to put things in context, we have a lot of work to do. But that's the transaction volume. You'll hear people talk about the price of Bitcoin and what, what that is today because it's a currency and it has value. That's not that interesting to me. What's interesting to me is whether or not people are moving it around. So um, that study that was conducted a few years ago happened when you can see very, very, basically there's very small transaction volume. Week over week, <clears throat> we're hitting records. So that means more and more people are starting to adopt and use Bitcoin to send value. So I find the, the uh, most interesting metric is just basically transaction volume. So, so what? Why are people all over the world talking about this? Why is Goldman Sachs and BBVA and NASDAQ and most of the venture capital firms in the world, Richard Branson and others, put money into Bitcoin projects? Microsoft, Dell, Overstock, OKCupid, WordPress, Wikipedia, all accept Bitcoin as forms of donation and for payment. They're doing it because it's the world's first, first scarce digital commodity. They can accept the payment with zero counterparty risk. They get 100% of the payment. There's no fraud. And uh, basically, it allows them to send value anywhere in the world instantly, basically for free. So at its core, here's kind of where we are. Um, when the protocol was launched, the people that were building that were software programmers and cryptographers and developers. And they're still doing that. They're volunteers to participate and basically maintain the core code base. There was a wave of builders, these were sort of the, uh, the early startups in the industry, building things like exchanges and wallets, consumer services, merchant services, mining services, and more. These are sort of the new verticals of future finance. And then uh, the next wave of innovation, which we'll hear about soon. Oops, sorry. <laughs> the next wave of innovation we'll hear about soon um, will be all kinds of really fascinating applications. If you take out an intermediary between a transaction, money is just the first experiment. What if I could get rid of all kinds of other intermediaries? How many people get really sick of waiting in line to get pieces of paper stamped and notary services? It's crazy. These are relics of ancient times, and we don't need to use them anymore. Um, this solves all kinds of wild ideas like property rights, uh, global governance, voting services with certainty that what you decided was actually shown. Um, we'll look at some of those examples soon. So, this is the, the investment landscape. Um, basically, there's been a huge amount of money poured into this. If you think that Bitcoin is sketchy, maybe that's uh, something that uh, you should reevaluate. The companies that are accepting Bitcoin have hundreds of billions of dollars of market capitalization. They don't do things when there's reputational risk. They make investments and votes of confidence when there's really interesting things happening. So there's been a massive amount of movement in this industry. It's still going very quickly, and you will see more and more names added to this list over the next 12 months and coming years. So <clears throat> with Bitcoin, it doesn't matter where you were from. It doesn't matter whether you were born in the first world or the third world, whether you're a mother sending college money to your daughter or a father setting wages back home to your family across the border. This is the most important innovation since the internet. And the reason is because people have financial independence to transact with whoever they want without somebody telling them what they can and can't do. And it's a really big deal. 
Um, I want to talk just quickly before I hand this over, and we'll be excited to have conversations about any questions you have. Um, but there's a story I want to share real quick. And uh, basically, when I was in Morocco um, last year with my sister, we went out into the desert, and uh, we had a Berber guide that was taking us um, into the dunes. And we hadn't seen an electrical system or any sort of sign of civilization uh, for a while. And uh, we're watching the sunset. It was absolutely beautiful. And in that moment, the whole thing was ruined when our guide, who sells rocks and polished geodes for a living, pulls out his iPhone 5 and answers his phone in the middle of the desert. And that guy has access now to a financial service and a financial network that is more efficient than hedge fund managers and more efficient than the ones that Fortune 500 CEOs have access to. So think about that for a minute. If you can put software on someone's phone that replaces banking functions, it's a really big deal. Um, five weeks ago, Goldman Sachs, uh, the largest investment bank in the world, released a report that said that 33% of millennials do not expect to have a bank account in five years. So if millennials don't expect to have a bank account in five years, and there are 2.5 billion people that don't have bank accounts whatsoever, and there are 4 billion people with no credit cards, how are they going to get their financial and banking services in the future? Well, I submit that Bitcoin and blockchain type services and software are going to solve a lot of these problems. So anyway, let's open this up for discussion. Bitcoin is not perfect. I will submit that, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear some really interesting arguments for why, and then I'll counter those to the best of my ability. <laughs> and uh, thank you.